Uh, welcome to uh, the parents that are out this afternoon. It's good to see, obviously, uh, discussions around school issues and programming and stuff like that are vitally important to, for parents as well as trustees, as well as the school councils around the province, and it's good to see, uh, you know, parents coming and participate or uh, observing the meetings that take place for the school board. It's also understandable that parents take such an active role in, uh, in, in their children's child's life as a, as a schooling process. And uh, all of us around the table have been through that with our own children working up through. And it's the reason why we're at the table today is as a result of the fact that we take time and, and invest it in the school system. So welcome trustees around the province. We only have one that is absent today, a trustee from the West Coast, Pamela Gill. She had a previous engagement, so she sends her regrets. Um, therefore, without further ado, we're going to continue on with the meeting. Uh, we have a, a regular agenda. So can I uh, entertain a motion? Moved by Tom, uh, Trustee Kendall, seconded by Trustee Lee to uh, accept the agenda as presented. All in favor? Aye. Those against? Motion carries. Second bit is the consideration of uh, the minutes uh, from previous meetings. First one is the board meeting minutes on June 8th, 2019. These were all circulated to all trustees prior to the meeting, so they should be there. So can I get a motion to uh, accept the minutes as presented? Moved by John, uh, Trustee George, seconded by uh, Trustee Simmons. Uh, any discussion, question? Any errors? Hearing none, motion, uh, all in favor? Those against? Motion carries. So that was the June 8th uh, meeting. Now uh, 3.2 is the August 5th meeting. Uh, can I get a motion to, uh, to accept those minutes? M moved by uh, Trustee Carter, seconded by Trustee Lee. Any errors or omissions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion of acceptance? Those against? Motion carries. Um, Business arising, 4.1, uh, the ad hoc committee report for the Constitution. I will turn the floor over to Hayward, the Trustee Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the June 8, 2019 uh, meeting in Goose Bay, I noticed a motion was put forward with respect to changes to the Constitution and bylaws. I'd like now to uh, bring forward those changes and introduce the two motions necessary to uh, vote on the proposed changes. Before I do that, I, I just want to thank the people who served on that committee, and they were John Smith, who's uh, since retired from the board, Ray Bennett, Kevin Ryan, Winston Carter, John George, Tom Kendall, and myself. And I do want to thank each uh, of those trustees for the work that's gone into this process. First, I'll start with the amendments to the Constitution. 4.1. In accordance with Article 9, amendments to Constitution of the Board, Constitution, a notice of motion was given at the Board meeting of June 8, 2019, that the Board would table proposed amendments to the Constitution for debate and vote at the September 7, 2019 board meeting. Such proposed changes were discussed and debated at the June 8, 2019 meeting. Therefore, be it resolved that Article 4, membership. Number two, remove zones 14 to 17 from the Eastern region and create a separate region entitled Northeast Avalon to incorporate zones 14 to 17. Article 5, officers, officers of the board. D, members at large. Change references of four members at large to five so that it reads as follows. The, mem the officers of the board shall include five members at large with one member at large representing each of the, the five regions of the district, Labrador, Western, Central, Eastern and Northeast Avalon. Article 6, Committees of the Board, should now read number 2, Standing Committees with the addition of 
Audit and Risk Management Committee. I'm making the motion. I move that the board adopt the revised board constitution with the amendments as outlined pending ministerial approval. Thank you, uh, Hayward. Uh, do I have a seconder to the motion? Uh, seconded by John George. Discussion? So this has already been through the second time that we've got, so now it's sort of in its final format. No, no further discussion? All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Those against? Motion carries. Second? Thank you. I now move forward with the amendments to the bylaws. In accordance with Article 20, amendments to bylaws and the bylaws of the board, a notice of motion was given at the board meeting of June 8, 2019, that the board would table proposed amendments to its bylaws for debate and vote at the September 7, 2019 board meeting. Such proposed changes were discussed and debated at the June 8, 2019 meeting. Therefore, be it resolved that, under definitions, G, change four members at large to five, change reference to regions of the district to board, the addition of the Northeast Avalon region, and under O, change reference from district to board. Article 1.02, regular meeting, remove in accordance with section 63.2 of the Schools Act and not less than once every three months, and add six meetings per annum so that it reads as follows. The board shall hold six meetings per annum to transact the business of the board. The dates and times of the meetings shall be set forth by resolution of the board. Article 2, election of officers. 2.03, remove election chair and add designated parliamentarian shall be the scrutineer for the election process. Article 3, general procedures for meeting. 3.01S, remove section pertaining to including meetings in which there is a closed meeting and the last section, which in any event shall not exceed one hour so that it reads as follows. Public meetings of the board shall be adjourned after 2.5 hours unless the trustees vote with a minimum two-third majority vote in favor of an extension. Article 4, Agenda 4.03, change unanimous consent to two-third consent to add an item to the agenda. Article 7, Committees 7.01, addition of Audit and Risk Management Committee under Section D, 7.02, Executive Committee, B, change from four to five other trustees representing each region of the board. L, change determine to facilitate in reference to education and training needs of trustees. 7.02, Finance and Operations Committee. B, the responsibilities of the Finance and Operations Committee will be as follows. Two, remove reference to generate provincial pre-budget items. And 11, remove reference to risk management matters. Addition of a new committee, 7.05, Audit and Risk Management Committee. Article 8, Quorum, 802, change 30 minutes to 15 minutes. And Article 802, I'm sorry, Article 803, change 30 minutes to 15 minutes. Article 9, Conflict of Interest, 901, see the addition of an district policy so that it reads as follows. All trustees shall be familiar and act in accordance with the conflict of interest laws as stipulated in the Schools Act, Section 68 and 69, and district policy. 
Article 11, public participation at board meetings. 11.01, .01, add at a physical or virtual location so that it reads, a meeting of the board will be open to the public at a physical or virtual location unless it is declared by a vote of the trustees to be a closed meeting from which members of the public shall be excluded. The motion, I move that the board adopt the revised bylaws with the amendments as outlined pending ministerial approval. Thank you, Hayward. Can I hear a seconder? A seconded by uh, Trustee Whittle. Uh, same, same thing goes for this. These are not new items for us around the table. They've been worked on and reviewed and, and gone through, so we're just going through the motion of uh, following the timelines as per the by bylaw and constitutional change issues. So therefore, uh, one question coming from Trustee Kendall. Can you uh, turn your mic on there, please? No problem. Oh, there it is. In terms of the amendments to the Constitution and bylaws, um, do we uh, have to wait until the minister approves those, or can we go ahead and, and enforce them now? Okay. So, uh, like any, any activity that we do that uh, changes or does things with our Constitution bylaw, we have to go through our internal process, and we have certain timelines that we have to follow in order to be able to do that. Okay. We've been going through that process, but the final item has to go to the minister before our final acceptance of the changes that we're recommending. So as soon as we've done this this afternoon, we will fire the recommendation, or assuming that the motion passes, the motion with the details will be forwarded to the minister for his final review and approval. And we have no idea, Chair, how long that will take, because with my previous experience with other boards, you know, it's taken maybe a year or two. Uh, possibly, but I think the dialogue has been ongoing a little bit about this already, so it may be, uh, it may be a swifter process this time. Uh, sorry. Uh, Trustee uh, Aspel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to your point, Tom, uh, if you outline in the request that our AGM is in October, then that often sets the tone that we need a response expedited. Um, the only question I have, and I wasn't at the meeting in Goose Bay, so my apologies, I didn't participate in the dialogue. Um, under the election uh, section two for election processes, I remember quite some time ago, we had a dialogue about uh, disclosure of the vote count after um, we had an RAG, like as each position was filled. Was, is that not, that wasn't included in the dialogue? No. Okay. Any further? Any further questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Those against? Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Harry Hayward, for chairing that committee and getting the work done so that we actually made the necessary uh, amendments. And now I'll do my job to encourage the minister to get back to us as quickly as possible in consideration of the fact that our AGM is next month. And we're certainly hoping that he's going to be present. Uh, you know, so that'll give us an opportunity for him to come along as well. Okay, next item of business is the director's report. So, uh, Mr. Stack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Trustees, members of the general public uh, joining virtually, members of the public that are attending uh, physically here today, uh, and a special welcome to the uh, community supporting the hashtag Deaf Children Matter. Um, this is, the, this is a uh, report on year two of the strategic plan. We are in the uh, position right now where we have a draft of the strategic plan report that has been submitted. Uh, it will come back for final uh, approval to you at uh, the next board meeting. We're hoping to have it back uh, from the processes from government by then. This is uh, a re an annual requirement of government processes as well as board processes. But I'll cover some of the highlights in year two of the strategic plan. Have a look at some of the highlights going into our final 
uh, year three of the strategic plan, which is uh, going to occur this year. And uh, just a, a bit of commentary about uh, an initiative we're hoping to launch. So strategic plan highlights, year two, it recovers, it covers the period July 1st to, to June of 2019. And as always, a quick reference to our three strategic goals on student success, safe and caring schools, and of course leadership development and organizational effectiveness. I'm happy to report that we've made progress in all areas and achieved all of the uh, outcomes that were um, in the strategic plan identified at the start of year two. Particularly, one of our, our key cornerstones in terms of student success is literacy. And uh, the comprehensive literacy framework for K-6 to was uh, finalized this year. We implemented a literacy plan for grades seven to nine. Quite a bit of professional learning. A lot of it um, augmented, of course, by our, our additional resources that we have for literacy in the province as a result of the Education Action Plan, which includes five new district-based program specialists uh, for reading and, and the school-based reading specialists in our phase one schools, as well as additional learning resource teacher resources. Uh, numeracy, equally important in our strategic plan. We this year, uh, last year we had a numeracy plan developed aimed at supporting core numeracy learning and uh, we've made important strides there. A lot of professional learning in the area around literacy. Um, of course, highlighted and supported by the addition of five new program specialists for K-6 mathematics around the province. Uh, in other curricular areas, there was uh, a significant push with respect to uh, professional learning for our teachers around autism spectrum disorder. Um, quite an uptake. A lot of this stuff was done online by teachers. Uh, we're very grateful for them for doing it um, on their own initiative in many cases, and we've made great strides in that area. With respect to financial literacy, uh, quite a bit on economic uh, education. Uh, we have a partnership with the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education, and we've partnered with, as well, collaborated with the Learning Partnership on an entrepreneurial adventure program, which uh, Basically, it's, it's in line with our deep learning initiative around programs that encourage students to create business ventures in the classroom. In other curricular areas, computer coding was a very important facet. We were fortunate to do some great work with Brilliant Labs. Uh, they operate out of this very building, and uh, we provided professional learning to over 1,000 participants this year uh, as well. We're he expanded the use of our technology with a comprehensive technology plan, uh, professional learning, particularly around our Google Suite platform, and uh, professional learning uh, for district uh, personnel. We have a Policy Tuesday, which is a virtual session that has a high uptake, and uh, it's been well received and well appreciated by our uh, leaders in the system. Under the Safe and Caring Schools strategic issue, school-wide positive behavior supports and intervention, we have professional learning, uh, data analysis, and use of Review 360 to track and analyze student behaviors to provide interventions. Uh, we've had 15 sessions with uh, over 300 participants in that area. Uh, and I, I could reference other proactive programs that we partner with uh, law enforcement agencies as well, such as uh, Strive, um, Roots of Empathy, Beyond the Hurt. Also a significant focus on internet and social media initiatives. There have been lesson plans that have been designed by our staff and distributed. Uh, in the area of LGBTQ uh, awareness, rights, a number of supporting lesson plans. We've had 30 sessions across the province with uh, 875 participants. In the area of mental wellness, mental health and wellness, implemented the go-to teacher training for guidance counselors uh, who train teachers in the schools in all grades seven to 12. And mental health first aid training continues this year. Additional training planned as we go into this school year. Uh, as well, we, we supported six staff to, uh, to gain applied 
suicide intervention training, the assist training instructor status, uh, and that was partnered with the new Nazi with government in Labrador. In terms of initiatives supporting healthy and active lifestyles, um, Active Schools has over 700 members, uh, did a lot of work around smoke-free properties as an example. In terms of accessibility in district facilities, uh, evidence here by our um, vertical lift to make this facility here accessible now as an accessible building. We've upgraded a number of automatic door openers around the province. Uh, some 38 schools have uh, benefited from accessible playground equipment installations um, but to the tune of around $400,000. In the area of occupational health and safety, uh, a number of initiatives there. We recognized that we had a lot of uh, work to do in that area, so we reorganized the OHS responsibilities uh, in the Human Resources Division. Um, there is uh, disability management has been assigned now to HR managers, and uh, we've added some modules to our uh, facilities uh, tracking request system to uh, increase tracking and reporting. In the operations, domain. We uh, have the school inspection enterprise management system that uh, continues to be uh, implemented and training for that in the for the managers and their trade staff is ongoing or was ongoing. In the area of student transportation, the Division of Student Transportation um, is now a member of the Newfoundland Labrador Construction Safety Association and we that includes cer certificate of recognition uh, we've had all of our schools receive district operated uh, the student transportation service have participated or conducted emergency school bus evacuations. We did the safe pupil online training. Over 95% of our 300 drivers, garage staff have completed that. In the area of leadership development, organizational effectiveness, this is uh, the Emerging Leaders Program. We briefed on this before. We've had 82 individuals uh, that are prospective future leaders in our system. Uh, this year, it's past year, we did a focus on assistant principals as well. Uh, in terms of electronic systems, we have an automated system now for unexpected vacancies to student assistants and secretaries, and this will be expanded to bus drivers in the coming year. And we have an electronic hiring package for teachers that will be expanded to teaching and learning assistants. And we plan to extend that to management and support staff this year. Student transportation, a number of protocols were implemented this year to enhance student safety and operational effectiveness. Uh, internal work order protocol resulted in 98, 988 work orders that were completed. Uh, we introduced School Messenger, which allowed for more immediate, focused, high-priority group communication between school transportation staff, contractors, and drivers. And we have plans to implement School Messenger district-wide in winter-spring of 2020. With respect, to, again, on the domain of organizational effectiveness, um, trying to fine-tune our purchasing processes and inventory controls, we now have a web-based asset management system. Um, tender, uh, a tender was completed and a purchase order issued for the installation of, a, of this asset management system district-wide. Training has begun and the system will be in use this school year. The district added a virtual server as well to host the inventory maintenance program and the program will incorporate the asset data collected manually in 2018 and expand upon that work. Uh, in the area of school based financial management. Uh, I've done a lot of professional learning, over 1,200 hours of professional learning on school finances, 311 principals and assistant principals, and over 230 secretaries. We, we do this uh, using a, a scenario-based case study exercises. Just uh, by way of, let's go back here, all right. By way of um, strategic issue, policies. This is important to pause here for a moment and reflect on the fact that since the inception of this particular iteration of the board, you, uh, in the first year of operation, there were seven policies approved, seven the next year, and this past year, 
this body approved eight, some 18 policies. So quite a bit of effort and work and kudos to you as a, as a body. In the area of communication to stakeholders, a lot of back to school communications this year. Our web pages were updated. We have a hub for families uh, on school policies, resources for coding, mental health, LGBTQ issues, et cetera. We're using an administrative planner now that used to be distributed as a giant volume of paper, uh, which is now completely and totally online and gets updated. It's a virtual document that, uh, a resource document that gets updated uh, live uh, day to day. We also uh, introduced Thought Exchange on a trial basis, uh, which is a, uh, a software that provides school communities uh, the opportunity to participate in decision-making processes. Uh, example, we used it in the Holy Spirit uh, Mount Pearl Senior High uh, system study and are continuing to finalize that procedure. And we've used it in a, as a professional learning tool for groups like senior staff. We used it for all of our principals this year to get uh, some feedback on learning and learning design. So that, that pretty much covers this past year in terms of uh, the highlights of the strategic plan. Looking forward into next year, just a few tree top items. Hazing prevention program will be introduced this year. Uh, training for teachers across the province. Um, it's, uh, it's intended for everyone, it's not just for athletes, but of course there is a focus on the athletic program as well. And it's uh, for all students at risk of hazing practices. As well, I'd like to draw attention to an upcoming event that we're very happy. The district is hosting a conference, the Corwin Visible Learning for Literacy, Numeracy, and Collaborative Leadership Conference, featuring world-renowned uh, educational researcher, Dr. John Hattie. It's open to all educators, and the conference will provide information on a school change model of professional learning and development. And it's designed to provide educators with tools to evaluate their impact on student achievement and make evidence-based decisions to accelerate student learning. So we're very excited about that, and that's coming in April, late April. Some other highlights for this year's strategic plan, purchase of a GPS system. So what that'll do, it'll enhance student safety because we'll have uh, route metrics such as speed and allow for on-the-road performance monitoring from a remote desktop. It'll provide information uh, when the bus started, how fast it traveled, where it traveled to, um, preventive maintenance, and responses to accidents. As well, under the organization uh, effectiveness, um, the, uh, we're going to uh, have a number of IT initiatives, specifically around enhancing our broadband connectivity. So this will be a, a, a huge boost to areas where we've had low bandwidth issues over the years. And we're very excited about this. The, um, the other piece uh, on the GPS system, it, it'll also provide functionality to allow parents to track their student's bus online. And this will result in a reduction of student wait time for buses. So this is uh, something that we're hoping to roll out very soon this year. Also, uh, another strategic plan highlight around organizational effectiveness. The online hiring package will uh, for support staff and management. We did it last year for teachers, this year for support staff. And SmartFind. SmartFind is a, a, a software tool, an automated dialing system that uh, will allow for substitute auto calling. We did it on the Buren Peninsula, very successful last year, and we'll be expanding that to central region this year. Just to mention as well the uh, education action plan to update you on that. Last year, 40 schools on phase one. This year, another 40 schools uh, so with, the, uh, with the remaining K-6 to schools to follow in year three. Um, so that's a total uh, huge effort, collaborative effort between the district and the department. Uh, significant supports in the area of human resources, reading specialists, t teacher librarian, teaching and learning assistants. We're doing a, quite a bit of uh, professional learning around this. And uh, by all accounts, I've heard individuals 
talked to one principal at the end of the year, and he said it's profoundly changed uh, what happens in his school and how uh, teachers are responsive to the learning of their students. The, um, their, uh, the other update on, on the phase two piece is that uh, we have a face-to-face -face with uh, the phase one schools at the end of this year. Did a, uh, a session in August uh, to prepare for what's happened this past week where all the phase two schools, of course, delayed their opening for a couple of days to go through our responsive teaching and learning policy. And that was uh, well received and getting good feedback on what happened this week. In terms of infrastructure, not a lot to report this year, uh, which is actually a good thing because it does show that, that uh, things are leveling off in terms of the, the pressures on our system. But uh, St. Peter's Primary in Mount Pearl, uh, extensive uh, extension that was uh, substantially completed. Mobile Central High, of course, we did the uh, extension and grade fives and six moved in. Bishop Field, work is ongoing. We anticipate reoccupancy in the new year. Uh, as well, we're doing a, a construction of a, a bus depot in Cornerbrook, which was we unfortunately lost to fire a number of years ago. Uh, Bay Roberts, replacement for Coley's Point Primary. The uh, contract has been awarded. Again, anticipated opening 2021. St. Albans, likewise, anticipated opening 2021. Gander Academy, again, awarded and similar, spring 2021. Paradise Intermediate, uh, again looking at uh, September 2021, and the school design is very similar to what uh, you've all seen at Waterford Valley High. Just, on, just to close on infrastructure for a minute, uh, we often get this question from you and it's important to report. Uh, very, we're moving these properties, some of them are difficult to move. These are closed schools in many cases. 10 properties have been sold or transferred since 2017. There are 17 left on the books, um, five of which are listed here that are in the sale process or transfer pending. We've also added uh, Clarenville Primary, uh, St. Teresa's in port and Our Lady of Labrador in West St. Modeste. Of the nine remaining of that 17, uh, some are currently in use, such as the former uh, Holy Cross, uh, the school in Humber Elementary is going to be repurposed as a board office, which will eliminate a huge amount of rental costs in that community. So uh, I'm pleased that the infrastructure file is moving. Uh, it was referenced by Trustee Blake, uh, I think, at the outset. We had commentary on this earlier. The school bus safety campaign was highly successful. The, uh, this was a result of your motion that you gave to us as a staff in June and we immediately had great cooperation from the various departments of government who were involved in bus safety. We, had, we launched it on uh, August 28th, great support from local media and a lot of uh, uptake from schools, teachers and district staff spreading the word, a few TV interviews. Uh, it was received positively. A lot of people, uh, hard to believe, but a lot of people didn't realize that in law, when a school bus stops, on the road, it's not just the traffic behind the bus, it's the traffic approaching the bus and the traffic alongside the bus. Everything has to stop until that star bomb is retracted and the lights go off and the children are safely across the road. That was a very successful campaign. And we're hoping that it has a positive effect, obviously. Uh, just to close, before I finish up here, uh, you've been hearing a lot as trustees, and a lot of our teachers have, and we've mentioned it at uh, many of these directors' updates regarding deep learning. And I won't go into all the parameters of deep learning, but we're excited. It uh, really tackles the issue of student engagement in a, in a positive, um, incredibly transformative way in some cases. We've had some great uptake in our schools. In many cases, um, we, are, we are following the initiative of a lot of brilliant teachers out there in the field. So to that end, world-renowned researcher, Dr. Michael Fullen, 
joined us, joined the senior staff in August uh, for a couple of, for about a day and a half. And it's absolutely huge to get this gentleman with us. Uh, he's doing it, I think, because he's, he's a Canadian, uh, world-renowned researcher, spends most of his time out of the country. He had come to us after spending time with, uh, in the area of Massachusetts trying to work with their system. And he's working a huge project in California with 10 million students, 1,000 districts, if you can take that in. And, and we had him in a room uh, with just 30 of us and picked his brain for a day and a half. And it was brilliant. Um, a lot of little gems came out of it. But what we're tro hoping to do is have unity of purpose or coherence around how we as a district, right from the top of the leadership down to the, the, into the individual schools, how we support and maximize student learning. So um, we'll unpack this over time. Uh, we intend to have it as a focus of our uh, we've, even, we've even changed the focus of our upcoming meetings with principals. Instead of calling them leadership meetings, now we're calling them uh, uh, leading learner meetings because the big key message there is that all of us, me included, uh, are learning together as to how best to maximize student learning. Uh, so more to follow on this. The coherence model is something that we delved into deeply. Uh, this gentleman is, uh, is committed to us verbally. He is uh, trying to formulate plans with his worldwide team right now to incorporate, incorporate us, the Newfoundland Labrador English School District, into that worldwide community of deep learning. Uh, and he has committed to having his team work with us over the next three years to completely embed this um, within the Newfoundland Labrador English School District and the province of Newfoundland Labrador. So we're very excited about what the potential could be here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm being told to turn my voice on. Uh, so th the work that your team and yourself do every day in a system that's huge across the province, and it's sometimes amazing that the fact that the day rolls out in all these places very uneventful in the terms of things that could go wrong. So it means that there are people on deck taking care of kids across the province. Any questions for the uh, CEO? Trustee Kendall. Okay, thank you, Chair. Just a question on uh, one of our schools in, Mil in uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, Milchris Academy. Is there a sale on that school or is there a transfer uh, pending? I am going to have to defer to Mr. Terry Hall. Um, there is a uh, agreement we have with the RCEC now that we're going to, we're just in discussions with a community consortium and the town to take over the building to bring in a load of community services, which would be a one-stop shop for all of the folks for uh, social activities and those types of things for when they go there. So we're still in discussions, but it appears as though it'll be a, a transfer to uh, a number of uh, individual um, services that have come together to form a... So there'd be no money coming uh, to the district from, from that particular school? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Trustee Carter. Uh, with regard to the safety, uh, the school bus safety campaign, uh, is this an ongoing campaign throughout the year, or are we finished with that process right now? So we did a we did a concentrated campaign. Uh, obviously, a social media campaign, media blitz, uh, awareness at the start of the school year. And, and the reason for that was based on your guidance that we needed to increase awareness. Um, but it'll be, it'll be um, part of our ongoing messaging. But the blitz part of it at the front of the school year, we felt was the best time to get this out there. And I think we were successful. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Mr. Chair. Trustee Burton. Um, Tony, you referenced the uh, installation of the GPS units on uh, board-owned buses. Uh, obviously a good thing and obviously a, a safety issue. Um, 
How does that, uh, is there a requirement on, on contracted services as well, or will that be coming, or is that something that will integrate into the contracted service? I think it's something that we can discuss with our contractors. Obviously, if they're already into an existing contract, it would be difficult for us to modify that contract now. But, uh, uh, Terry, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Um, uh, no, uh, Tony, you're absolutely correct. It is our intention, once we get our district-owned buses fully outfitted, to discuss with our contractors uh, a way forward in terms of do we embed it in the contract terms that if you want to do business with the district, your vehicle has to be equipped with GPS and you have to allow it to connect to our system. Our intent, ultimate intent is that uh, we are able to provide this service to all parents across the province that they're able to monitor the bus that their child is getting on so they know where it's to reduce wait times and, and uh, at bus stops for kids and those types of things and also monitor uh, these types of systems as uh, Tony mentioned in his presentation monitor everything down to as we did in the safety campaign when the lights are activated and when the stop arm is activated so we will know at any given time when uh, when the bus is stopped and that they're using the equipment properly if anyone ever uh, files a complaint we'll have the supporting backup thank you all right that, thank you again tony for that work next item on the agenda is our committee reports and the minutes associated with them so uh, 6.1 is executive committee report and i'm going to turn the floor over to our vice chair wayne Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, minutes of the Executive Committee meeting of July 10th are in your kit. There are no motions from the meeting. However, I draw your attention to the fact that the Executive Committee, following a recommendation from the Finance and Operations Committee on your behalf, appointed Ernst & Young as the external auditor for the five-year period from 2018-19 to 2022-23. I say there are no motions. I would entertain any questions on the minutes of July 10th. Seeing none, I would move that the board approve the executive committee report of July 10th, 2019 as presented. I so move, begging a secondary. Seconder is uh, Lester Simmons. Any further discussion, question? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Those against? Motion carries. Uh, second report uh, feedback is on 6.2 finance and operations report for July 9th meeting. And I'm going to turn to uh, Trustee Whittle for. Hit the wrong button. Oh, no. There we go. Not that I often need a mic. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I have uh, two sets of uh, minutes, two reports to go over with you and a couple nominations. Uh, just before that, uh, I'd just like Mr. Chair to. Uh, um, recognize the uh, Churchills uh, and their eight-year-old son, Carter, who's attending our meeting today. It's great to see an interest in uh, public democracy, considering that we're responsible for $1 billion, almost, of uh, taxpayers' dollars, and uh, witness the individuals who govern the K-12 system in our province. Um, I'll get into the Finance and Operations Committee report. Uh, the following motion of July 9th, 2019, the following motion was referred to the Executive Committee for approval on behalf of the Board, our external auditor appointment 2008 to 2019, 2022 to 2023. The School Act 1997 requires the district to submit to the minister at the end of each school year detailed statements of its accounts audited by a person licensed under the Chartered Professional Accountants and Public Accountants Act. The school district attempts to provide audited financial statements within 90 days of its year end. Audited services are included in the scope of the Public Procurement Act and the district selected the request for proposal method to identify a recommended supplier. Proposals were received from four suppliers. In accordance with the Public Procurement Act, the highest ranking proposal was deemed to be the preferred supplier Ernest and Young submitted the proposal with the highest rank. Um, we passed a motion at the committee meeting, uh, moved by me, seconded by Winston Carter, that the Finance and Operations Committee recommend to the board approval of the appointment of Ernest and Young as the external auditor for the five-year period from 2018-2019 to 2020-2023. That motion was carried. 
and the board approved the Finance and Operations Committee report of July 9th, 2019 as presented. Um, am I going to move the motion that we, uh, we accept that? Okay, so uh, I'd like to move a motion that the board approve the Finance and Operations Committee report of July 9th, 2019 as presented. Do I hear a second of the motion, seconded by Ray Bennett. Uh, any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Those against, motion carries. Next uh, item is the Finance and Operations Report of August 29th, 2019. Okay, uh, there are three motions from the meeting being referred to the board today for approval. The first one is with regards to the acquisition and borrowing of funds for school buses in 2020. Each year, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island undertake a joint school bus purchasing program. The tendering number, uh, 019 -1002 remember that, I'll quiz you later, has been awarded to Leeds Transit Incorporated for purchases for delivery in the spring summer of 2020. Within the district operated fleet of Newfoundland and Labrador English School District, there are two uh, 42 model year 2000 buses that have to be removed from service as of June 2020. In accordance with the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development Policy, the district is recommending replacing 39 of them. The motion that I'd like to move is the following that the board approve the recommendation of the Finance and Operations Committee to one, purchase 39 buses at a total cost of $4,741,687, HST included, and secondly, to borrow up to $5 million with an amortization period of 12 years with such approvals further subject to ministerial approval. The town of Port of Basque uh, has asked for a request for right-of-way easement. Um, they're looking for approval for a 15-meter right-of-way easement. The town recently acquired land next to St. John, uh, St. James Regional High School in the town of Port of Basque. The land does not have access from the main road, and the town is requesting a right-of-way easement to access the property to do snow clearing. The land is of no use to the district and it will not interfere with access to school property. So I'd like to move the motion that the board approve the recommendation of the Finance and Operations Committee to grant the town of Port of Basque request for a 15 meter right of way easement subject to survey and legal documents being prefer, uh, provided and uh, prepared by the town of Port of Basque. I have a seconder for that. Seconded by uh, Trustee Kendall. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Those against, motion carries. Uh, the next issue uh, requiring a motion is another request to purchase the former Vista Regional Office in Clarenville. The district has reached a request from the, I guess we received a request from the Salvation Army Church to purchase the former Vista Regional Office property located in Clarenville to operate their programs. They are offering an amount of $50,000 to purchase that building. The building was closed with the formation of the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District, and the district has clear title to the property. I would like to move the following motion. That the board approve the recommendation of the Finance and Operations Committee to sell the former Clarenville office property to the Salvation Army Church to be used for community programming for $50,000 subject to ministerial approval. Do I have a seconder for the motion? Seconded by uh, Trustee Aspel. Mm. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Those against? Motion carries. And so conclusion, more, okay. One more motion, Mr. Chair, uh, that the board approve the Finance and Operations Committee report of August 29 as presented. Thank you, can I get a seconder to the acceptance of the report? Again, uh, Trustee Aspel. Uh, any questions or concerns? All in favor? Aye. Those against? Motion carries. Thank you, 
Thank you very much for the work that you guys have done on the programs, as was alluded to in the director's report. There's, there's a lot of work that is coming out of the committees, whether it be finance and ops or HR and uh, programs. So that's uh, one of the places where we get most of the work done associated with the board, which I think is sometimes not perceived in the same, the same way. Uh, new business, uh, 7.2 is the next report. Well, did I miss one? Oh, I, I already thanked them for the work they did, and they haven't done anything. How is that entirely possible? <laughs> okay, I apologize. Uh, it was not deliberate to cause uh, Kevin not to have an opportunity to speak. All right, Kevin, our newly minted executive member from the uh, Avalon re or the Eastern Region. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as of August 27, 2019, there were several items of information, and there were going to be three motions brought forward to the board. An overview was provided to the committee about the new student services division, highlighting major responsibilities for each of the focus areas. And this information has been disseminated to you this morning. We have an item on a pilot project, no final exams in grade seven to grade nine. The assessment evaluation and reporting committee is proposing a three year no final exam pilot project starting uh, this, this year. The project would involve students in grades seven to nine. Historically, there's been an over emphasis on summative testing, mid years and finals from grade seven to grade 12, but there's little research to suggest that the time and resources that go into preparation and completion of those exams has any positive impact on student achievement. Instead, there is research which indicates that a focus on a formative type of assessments has much better feedback. In order to take part in the pilot, in the pilot principals were required to get the approval of their staff as well as school council in order to take part. Schools can opt in or opt out for the period 2019-2022. At the end of the pilot, the committee will recommend a decision either to establish a consistent district-wide approach or to drop the idea altogether. It's an experiment. Our policy on student records, and this is a motion, people. As for the Department of Education and Early Childhood Safe and Caring Schools policy, Procedure 7, a parent of a student or the student may request that a preferred or chosen name and or gender be used on school records rather than the student's legal name or gender. In the event of such a request, the school administrator will make the necessary changes to records. The updated student records policy supports students who wish to use a preferred name versus a legal name for select student records. Legal names must be maintained, however, uh, in a name and gender as recorded on the birth certificate or certificate issued under the Change of Name Act 2009 or Vital Statistics Act 2009. The name on the student record, the CUM file, all records retained in the confidential file, and the student legal name field in school management software. This is to accommodate people um, obviously who have to change their name, but want to do so without having to go through that legal process. Um, I move, therefore, that the board approve the amended student records policy as recommended by the programs of HR committee, begging a seconder. So we have a seconder in Eric. Uh, any questions, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Those against? Motion carries. Kevin. Thank you. Um, this next item is also a motion. The district is committed to the prevention of child maltreatment and to the well-being and safety of students entrusted to its care. The district requires employees to be vigilant in their efforts to identify children who may be in need of protective invent intervention and to report all relevant information to the Department of Children, Seniors, and Social Development as per requirements of the Children, Youth, and Families Act. 
In 2019, the Children, Youth, and Families Act was proclaimed with a number of substantial changes in legislation. As a result of those changes in the legislation, the district was required to review and amend policy to be in line with the new act. Uh, the changes in policy include the change of name of the act itself from uh, Children and Youth Care Prevention Act um, to the Children, Youth, and Families Act. The fact that the act now applies to a child under the age of 16 as well as a youth from the age of 16 to 18. And reference to reporting to the Associate Director of Education of Programs and Human Resources. If there are no questions, I'll move that the Board approve this amended Protection of Children and Youth Policy as recommended by the Programs and HR Committee. Taking a seconder. Seconded yes, by uh, Scott Burden. Discussion questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the amends? Those against? Motion, Motion carries. carries. Thank you. The third item, and this is the third motion, is called the Political Activities for Trustees Motion. As we all well remember, we had quite a discussion about this some time ago, and I had this, our committee had this ready to roll at the last meeting, but time was our enemy. And we couldn't get it all put together fast enough. We did some research and the Sharif Richard was shared out um, across Canada with the issue of people holding two elected positions simultaneously. And that tended, to, that tended to be problematic in many jurisdictions. Newfoundland, however, did not say that we could do it or we could not do it. Newfoundland and Labrador makes no commentary on it at all, and so all, all organizations are left to sink or swim on their own. There was much discussion on it, and the recommendation that came out of all the discussion uh, was that once a trustee declares their intent to seek a nomination for the, for the positions of a school council member, a member of the House of Assembly, or member of Parliament, then the trustee must take a leave of absence from the board. If successful, the trustee shall resign from the board. If unsuccessful, the trustee will reassume their duties as a member of the board. All that being said, this is what is called the soft landing. We can step back from the board, we can run in these elections. If we're not successful, we can come right back. We're not take it away from the board. I know there was some discussion with the distinction between running as a candidate and going around knocking on doors. And that is where the line is drawn. Yes, we have the right um, to the charter to go around and knock on doors politically. However, this, what we're doing here, limits our right a little tiny bit. And there are limitations in rights. It limits it so that we can't sit as two elected officers at the same time. For example, it would be, I would consider it wrong of me to be an MHA and a member of this board at the same time. It would be wrong of me to be an MP, be a member of this board at the same time. I would consider it difficult to be a member of a school council and be a member of this board at the same time. Then we came to municipalities. And you see it's not, it's not reflected here. And the thought was, yeah, well, I hate to use this term, but outside the overpass, um, in the smaller centers of Newfoundland, there's so few of us out there that the, the field of leadership is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so it may, these little communities may actually be, be hurt 
if one of, one of us were to be on a board here and not be able to be part of the community um, council out home. But we'll let uh, let's see what the, what the table decides. You moving a motion there? Uh... I'll move a motion, yeah. That the board approve the political activity policy with trustees as recommended by the programs and HR committee. Do I hear a seconder? Seconded by Le uh, uh, Lester Simmons. Now this question and discussions. Uh, we're going to go around the table, I suspect a little bit. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to go to Jennifer, then we'll go on to Keith. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of things that you mentioned. So you keep talking about holding two elected offices at one, at one time. But if somebody declares their intent to seek a nomination, they're not elected to anything. Um, you're just seeking a nomination. Not until you are successful in the nomination do, do you actually represent any particular political party. So that's an error with wording as far as I'm concerned. Um, and realistically, the nomination processes are very limited, right? Two days, three days, four days. So in the amount, of, are we really having any effect if a trustee declares their intent to seek a nomination and knows within four days whether or not they are successful. Obviously, yes, if you're successful in achieving the nomination, then you would resign because you cannot be participating in political activity and holding your seat as a trustee. But as it reads now, I would not support this because uh, it, I don't see the purpose of Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, share the same sentiment. Uh, my, my concern is that the research that was done refers to um, holding two public offices simultaneously, which I totally understand would be a conflict of interest. But as Trustee Aspel had mentioned, uh, seeking a nomination is one thing. Winning a nomination uh, is something else. And I think that it should be worded that if one is to win a nomination, then it can be a leave of absence should be uh, taken place. But seeking a nomination, to me, by far, is not near as uh, political, in quotation marks, as a lot of volunteerism is with party lines that currently goes on in the province, or, or uh, on the federal level, or municipal for that matter. Uh, we can go around the table. Uh, anybody left on this side that's interested to have a commentary? Uh, Ray. Ray. I just have one question. Uh, could a friendly amendment be made on that now? You could entertain a, a friendly amendment. But then the, only, the only part of this, we have a process. And I, I, Mike. Should step, I should step back. We have a process, and the process is that this is a, gener this is not, this is a generator recommendation from the committee. And they're, uh, they've made this. What I would suggest is that we go through this process and it might come back to, we can send it back to committee to be revised or is there a way to get this on the table today? We could, yes. Just a straight amendment without the fact that it came from committee. Okay, all right. Yep, okay. So what we will do is uh, go around the table, let everyone speak to this. Then we will uh, address the potential of the friendly amendment and get that done, and then we'll take the vote at the end. Okay? Everyone in comfortable with that? Good. Uh, Mr. We're going to go back to Jennifer on this side, and then we'll be on the other side of the divide. Just, just on, a, uh, on, on a parliamentary procedure, a motion of parliamentary procedure, I believe I'm allowed to interrupt uh, whoever's speaking on that. Um, the rules of order are pretty clear. If somebody wants to move a motion, we then speak to the motion. If everybody speaks to the original motion and then you do that, they won't have an opportunity to speak to the original motion again because you're only allowed to speak to it once. In our rural state, you can only speak to it for three minutes. So I think if someone in their first turn wants to bring the amendment forward, we have to allow them to do it. If not, we're not following parliamentary procedure. Can we go 
Go to the parliamentarian. Amendment should be heard. Sorry about that. Um, um, I understand the question is whether the friendly amendment should be made now before uh, discussion on the motion. Uh, Mr. Parliamentarian, my question, or I'm trying to point out from Robert's Rules of Order, is that you get to speak to the original motion once, you can speak to the amendment once, but once you've spoken to the original motion, you can't speak to it again. I think there might be conversation, maybe a compromise or something that might come out of the second motion. So I would like the opportunity to uh, speak to the original motion after we've debated an amendment. And if the amendment's accepted, well, I'd still speak to it. But that's, you know, it's pretty clear in Robert's Rules of Order. That's the way things happen, right? Yeah, um, and, and, and Trustee Whittle, the, come on. Uh, uh, the question, as I understand it, is whether the friendly amendment should be made now before the trustees address the motion. The friendly amendment then becomes the motion on the table. An amendment to the motion could not be brought forward uh, uh, without, uh, at, at this time, without... Uh, yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying to you is whether it's a friendly motion or not a friendly amendment, yeah. The speaker, first time around, has to introduce that motion when they speak. If it's not debated then, uh, it's not, we're not following our own rules. It is, his time to speak is now, his motion is now. We have the discussion on the amendment and a seconder, and then we vote on that and we continue discussion. And it's parliamentary procedure, yeah. right, 101. Um, uh, I, I agree with uh, Trustee Whittle except that I think a friendly amendment can be made uh, and then the trustees give an opportunity to address that. The seconder would have to uh, agree to the, uh, to the friendly amendment, but a friendly amendment would operate as an exception to the rule, I think, that you've identified? Well, to be a friendly amendment, 100% of the board would have to uh, agree with it. So, you know, we have to decide if it's a friendly amendment or first. You have to have consensus of everyone to do that. You know, I, I hate to waste people's time on procedure, but I keep getting nailed all the time for uh, not following the rules, so I just want to point it out. Um. Okay, so what we, what we will do is uh, I get a sense around the table. There is, uh, there is a consensus feeling that there could be a friendly amendment. I get the body language, and I always read body language terribly. But so I'm hoping that I'm reading something reasonably well here that there is a friendly amendment feeling around the table. So uh, I'm going to go back to the original mover. And uh, are you going to uh, suggest a friendly amendment? I will, suggest, I will suggest a friendly amendment uh, if uh, anyone on the committee wants to throw apples at me, get them ready, okay? Um, Let's take out the piece that said, declares their intent to seek a nomination. And let's put it back with, is nominated. So here's how it would now read. That the Programs and Human Resources Committee recommend to the board that once a trustee is nominated for school council member, house assembly, parliament, the trustee must take a leave of absence from the board and so forth. Was that the per the... Yeah. If the trust... That wasn't part of our. No, but one is the same as the other. If you if you're nominated, you're representing a party. Okay, now we got to debate. No, 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 no. This is not part of the debate. No, no. If you uh, if you settle on a friendly amendment, I'm settled. I I'm I'm okay with that. Is the seconder willing to second the friendly amendment? All right. So I just need clarification, and I understand completely that if you decide to run for any type of political party in at any form of politics, provincial, federal, that obviously it, it would be reasonable for you to step back from your role as a trustee. My concern is that what what 
parameters, if any, are we putting in place that a trustee cannot actively be a part of a political campaign? There is really no, I mean, yes, there is a difference, but there's not a difference. Right. That's, that's not it, but that's not in the motion. All right, so that might be further discussion down the road associated with political activity that's acceptable and not acceptable as a trustee. But we have not addressed that in this, this motion. So this is strictly on whether you can be both at the end of the day, which we're accepting you can't be based on the motion. Okay, any further discussion on this side? Trustee Cullifan. And, 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 and this is just for clarification. And just because this may happen down the road, and I'd like to know what the legality is from Robert's rule of order. Is there such thing if Jennifer or another trustee wanted to propose a double friendly amendment? Is there such a thing? If she, if okay. she wanted to add that piece, is so that legally allowed? No. Okay, so we, we, we've got our, uh, our, our designated individual for this here. I, I think it was more for down the road, right, Keith? It's not for a solution here. What I'd suggest is that uh, we're going to take that under advisement and we're going to come back with an answer after. Does that meet your, so therefore we can come back at a further time. We're going to continue on with the uh, amendment as it stands right now. Uh, Mr. Chair, just while I, just okay. while I have the advantage of having the mic, uh, I understand <laughs> the amendment that Trustee Ryan made. Uh, what I'm not clear on is when would the trustee then have to resign the office as opposed to take a leave? Is it on winning the nomination or winning the election? No, winning the nomination. Winning the election. Winning the election. So let's just, like, we're going to go back to the mover and we're just going to make sure he's clear. Here's what we have. Okay, I'll read the whole thing for you. We recommend to the board that once the trustee is nominated for the positions of school council member, member of the House of Assembly, or member of Parliament, that the trustee must take a leave of absence from the board. If successful in the election, the trustee shall resign from the board. In other words, if successful as an MHA, an MP. Yeah. 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 No. I, I, I get it, but the first sentence to me, the, it's a technicality, but it's not making sense. A person cannot be nominated as an MP. Nominated as a political candidate. Right. 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 That, that's all nominated I'm saying. As a, as a candidate. Right. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, I strongly agree. You can't serve two masters, and uh, I think uh, having a look at the rules on that is pretty progressive of this organization. I think it's wonderful. However, I am having a little bit of an issue with school councils being bumped up with elections to higher office. Uh, from my opinion, public opinion, uh, school council is not a public office. School council is a decision by a group of parents, part, basically a PTA uh, decided amongst a group of people in a room. It is not a public office. And I don't know why we're including it here. If we want to put it in our constitution that you can't be a member of the school council and the board, fine. But this idea, you know, this idea that someone, uh, I, I just don't think that, that we can tell people they, you know, we need to spell it out somewhere else. This is, I mean, it's not a public office to start with. Okay. And I don't think that, uh, I don't, you know, it causes me not to be able to vote for the amendment, for sure, okay. uh, if we can't uh, address that. Thank you, uh, Trustee Whittle. Uh, Trustee Ayers, and then anyone on the... Yeah, I, uh, speaking to that, I realize that... Uh, that the uh, school council is not a public office, but if if you're a trustee, and uh, you, as a trustee you're representing a particular school and you're uh, on a school council for the same school, wouldn't that put you in conflict? We have. I, I don't know. Maybe I dreamt it up, but we're going to have some cross debate here now. 
We have conflict of interest regulations. Mm -hmm. We either follow our conflict of regula inf interest regulations or we don't. Uh, okay. We're going to go around our conflict of interest regulations. If I have a conflict of interest, I remove myself from the table. Okay. That's what we always do. Now, why of a sudden are we going to single out so, rural school counselors? And the same argument could be made in rural Newfoundland. So, where, where you, you want to assist in your local Peter? school, there's not a lot of volunteers, and you run as a trustee, but you can't? Peter? So. As you very eloquently said earlier on, we go around the table and give each the chance to speak once or twice on the amendment. So that's getting up there. Thank you, uh, Eric, for your contribution. Any further contribution on this side of the table? Uh, Trustee Burden. Um, can I speak to the original motion? <laughs> <laughs> no. You're part of the friendly crowd. I, uh, I would recommend, Mr. Chair, that this go back to committee. I believe that there have been too many concerns highlighted today uh, that a friendly amendment is going to fix, and I think that we should go back to committee. And, and It doesn't seem like there's any urgency unless something has sprung on us in the next couple of weeks. Days. Um, I think the procedure where we're to now is we need a vote on this. If it fails, then it has to go back to committee anyway. Okay? So... That's where we're to. Any further questions or discussions on the motion? We've got very good feeling on, on the piece. Anybody else want to speak? No? Okay, so those who are in favor of the amended motion, emotion. Amended motion, uh, say aye. Raise the hands, please. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think. The, uh, it's in the negative. It's defeated. So that's straightforward. Now it goes back to uh, committee for reevaluation and representation. Thank you very much for that long route to get to what I think I said in the first place. All right. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all. Uh, we're not quite done yet. We have a French programs policy update. And as you know, last year we approved a new French program. And in Regulation 2.8, it says that multi-grading and multi-aging may be utilized in existing early to late French immersion programs in communities where there is a single system of schools and the program is experiencing declining enrollment from administrative regulations and add to policy directives. Uh, committee members felt that this particular provision should be a policy directive as opposed to an administrative regulation. And we've asked the, um, Mr. Walsh in particular, uh, to present an amended policy to the committee for consideration at the regularly, next regularly scheduled meeting of um, the Programs Committee. The next item was the Request from Mr. Churchill. Committee members consider a request from Mr. Todd Churchill to present that the next public meeting of the board, uh, and quote, on the topic of deaf education and how it is being delivered to children like my own son Carter and others like him, end quote. After very careful consideration and some debate, no argument. The committee agreed to the following, that the Churchills be provided the opportunity to provide a written submission and or a recorded video outlining their concerns to the board to be heard at the September 7, 2019 closed working session. This video was shown to us at our working session earlier, and I thank Mr. Churchill for providing us with that presentation. This ends my report. Move to accept it. I move to that this be accepted as read, as presented, making a seconder. Seconder before Second we first. entertain any discussion. Okay. Seconded by Mr. Burden. Discussion? Um, item 5.7 that the chair uh, spoke to, uh, but before I, I address that, I'd just like to say publicly uh, a big thank you to the chair of our committee. It's a lot of work, 
uh, and uh, it's uh, and and uh, our chair comes into meetings and he's and he's ready to go and prepared and and things flow very well and I believe that the uh, the minutes reflect that just to to speak to item 5.7 the Churchill request I'd like for the record to show that uh, I uh, I voted against that motion. I'd like to be identified as voting. I'd like to be identified as well as having voted against that motion, and uh, I supported the request. Okay. Any further discussion or commentary? Uh, Trustee Aspel. Uh, my question is around 5.2, the pilot project for no final exams. Um, I'm wondering if there, how many schools are are intended to be in the pilot project? And it's for this school year. So, is there a deadline for schools to opt into the program? But we're going to go to Ed to get the. Uh, thank you. Um, we don't have a, a set number of schools for the pilot. It's pretty much uh, open uh, to anybody who's interested. It's really an extension of the no midterms pilot that's currently underway in the district, and we have some 60 odd schools that are participating in that. So uh, the answer is no, there's no limit to it. Um, when schools signify their interest, uh, we'll, if they meet the criteria that we've outlined, uh, we'll accept them into the pilot. Okay, any further questions or on the report? Uh, Trustee Carter. Yeah, uh, this information, is that right now, is that in the hands of all the principals in the schools? That process is underway as we speak. That we're, we're speaking about the no Yes. Yeah. So that that information is currently out into the system, and we're you know we're actively accepting uh, expressions of interest. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further? Hearing none. Can I all in favor of accepting uh, the chair's report from programs? Aye. Those against. Peters is not accepting the report. Sorry, I was just I was just clarifying. Yeah, no. Okay. Perfect. Uh, motion carries. Next item is under new business. We have uh, 7.1, there is no report or meeting, so there's no report. 7.2, Education Foundation report of August 14, 2019. I'm going to be looking to, who's speaking to the education report? Me, Tom. sir. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, I'm pleased to present the report from the Education Foundation. Uh, for a meeting on August 14, 2019. There were two motions approved at this meeting. Uh, number one, the approval of the scholarship recipients for the 2018-2019 school year. The foundation received 138 applications from students within the province, and the scholarship policy states that 27 students receive a $1,000 scholarship 11 from Avalon Region, 6 from Central Region, 5 from Western Region, 3 from Labrador Region, and 2 at-large recipients. Based on selection criteria for each region, 27 successful candidates were chosen. Uh, a motion was made at our committee uh, that uh, by Scott Burden, seconded by Kevin Ryan, that the Newfoundland Labrador Education Foundation Board approved the list of Newfoundland and Labrador Education Foundation scholarship recipients for 2018-2019 as presented, and that was carried. Uh, secondly, uh, approval to order 2019-2020 NLEF calendars. Following my request for quotes, Bounty Print was a successful bidder for the 2019-2020 NLEF calendars. Those calendars are distributed to NLESD schools, employees, and trustees. We anticipate an order of 1,250 calendars at approximate cost of $1,100, which is on par with orders over the past two years. Uh, it was moved by Kevin Ryan, seconded by Pamela Gill, that the Newfoundland Labrador Education Foundation Board approve the ordering process for the NLEF calendars for the 2019-2020 school year, and that was carried. So I am moving that the board approve the Education Foundation report of August 14, 2019, as presented, begging a seconder. 
Do we have a seconder? Uh, uh, Kevin, second. Any questions for further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of accepting the uh, report? Aye. Aye. Those against? Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Tom. They're going to get you to turn off your mic. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this year, I attended two meetings of the School Milk Foundation, one on March 13th, and I believe uh, the minutes of the March 13th meeting are in your package. So you know there, and the other meeting was on July 10th. The minutes of July 10th will not be released until they're approved at the December meeting. So, <laughs> but both both meetings. Uh, March and July basically dealt with the same issues. Uh, there was a bit of con concern. One of the concerns came up about Canada's new food guide, which has uh, excluded uh, dairy and uh, all milk and all dairy from uh, from their food guide. And uh, of course, this doesn't bode very well for for milk sales. And uh, 2018-2019 milk sales were already down approximately five and a half percent. So, as a result, uh, we are looking at uh, three programs. I can't say new programs; they are new promotions. They're not new promotions; they're old promotions glossed over a bit, because uh, you can enter the, these promotions online this year, as opposed to. Uh, well, we had a lot of complaints from uh, cafeteria workers and uh, teachers responsible for school milk program about it being so labor intensive and they'd lose their um, milk bucks and, and this sort of thing. So now they can enter a, a number online as soon as they get them. And uh, there will be prizes. Uh, one is the milk run, uh, which is for K to 4. and. Uh, any classroom that com completes a map, every milk will give them part of a map. Any classroom that completes a map will be entered in a draw for one of uh, three uh, classroom iPads. Uh, the major one is the what was called the smilk box, which is from K to 12. In previous years, uh, there were big prizes, like, you know, like, well, I shouldn't say now trips to the Bahamas because nobody wants to go. But, you know, like <laughs> trips, you know, big trips and so on, you know, costing ten and $15,000. This year they're going to go down a different road. Uh, there's going to be 20 draws, two per month, during the school year. That's, this is for teachers who are sponsoring the school milk in their school. 20 draws of $100 visa cards for teachers. And for the students, there will be 20 draws of $500 prizes each for students who participate in the, uh, in the smoke box. Okay. Uh, both providers, uh, milk providers, uh, Saputo Incorporated and Agripor Cooperative indicated that as of now, September, <laughs> that there would be an increase in milk prices of approximately five cents per unit whether you buy the uh, 250 mil or the 500 mil, right? That's not a concern. Um, also this year, a group of uh, health professionals from various departments of the uh, government are reviewing the school food guidelines uh, with the overall goal to better conform to Canada's food guide, right? And as part of this review, there will be a pilot program introduced in 11 schools in the province. The pilot, and they wouldn't tell us, may or may not contain chocolate milk, right? There's a possibility that chocolate milk, despite all its benefits of milk consumption, will be removed from the schools because of its sugar content. It will be put in the same category as pop and other things and will not be permitted to be sold in schools. And the School Milk Foundation is very concerned about this because chocolate milk currently holds 72% of all sales of milk in schools in Newfoundland. And that if, if chocolate milk is taking it, taken out of the schools, that there may not be enough demand 
for white milk products to have it delivered to certain areas of our province. Obviously, St. John's wouldn't be a problem or anything like that, but if you're trying, you know, if you're trying to, to uh, deliver to Gray River or somewhere like that, uh, you might not get any because there wouldn't be enough going to, uh, to allow for that. <coughs> so like I said, currently chocolate milk accounts for 72% of the sales. That's what was discussed in both our meetings. Anybody with any questions on, there's no motion required for this, of course. But if anybody had any questions, I'd try to answer them. Thank you for the extremely uh, in-depth report on our milk system. <laughs> well, no, thank you very much, that's Eric. It. That's very good. Yeah. Um, that completes the uh, committee committee reports. What? See, the, his minutes and stuff like that are uh, you, you can just move your report that you made the report. Do you want to move it? Moved by Eric, seconded by Peter. Uh, any questions? All in favor? Those against, motion carries. Thanks a minute, Moody and Eric. Um, the eight is a standing item, which we always have. It's the correspondence in, correspondence out on the board. Are there any questions regarding specific correspondence? Uh, Trustee Aspel. 8.3, are we adding that request to our school review process? Hillview Academy. It's a catchment. Yeah, that, that's uh, the. Uh, oh. th yeah, that, that's involved. Yeah, they, they're. That'll probably be incorporated into. Uh, you know, subject to, of course, the process. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any further, Tom? I think it is turned on. Uh, where Elview Academy is? Elview, yeah. Uh, That's fine. I was thinking it was, I was, thinking it was Norris Iron, but I wasn't sure. It's not like our former Minister of Tourism. He hasn't been to every community. <laughs> thank, thank you. A any further questions regarding correspondence? Just a question on the uh, correspondence sent to uh, 9.7, district response to Beta Spear Academy. Just wondering what the district response was. It's in your package there. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't have it open, so. Sorry. All right. Any uh, further questions? Um, yeah. I just, Sorry, Peter. Just on a, on a point of privilege and more of a guest than anything else, uh, just for a minute since we've been so good this, today, a, a few people ha uh, of my colleagues have raised the fact that I'm wearing a white sports coat today, and apparently uh, Coco Chanel said you're not supposed to do this after the Labor Day weekend. Well, you know I'm not a big person for following the rules, and this is my statement for that today. Thank you very much. Her retirement book. WKRP. We're now going to move on. All right, so the, ne the next order of business in our normal process is I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session. So moved by Wayne, seconded by uh, Hayward. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those against, motion carried. So we're going to take a five-minute break just so that we can do the uh, transition from uh, open to closed. Thank you. And